Has this ever happened to you? I'll tap that and play a soul ring. And a turn one soul ring. Turn one soul ring. Look, we've all got soul ring in our decks, but there's a whole world of one drops out there. Ramp and removal, tutors and counters. If you play your cards right, one mana can do it all. That's a one way ticket to Value Town. Opponents got a threat. There's a one drop for that. Need to draw some cards. There's a one drop for that. Need more mana. One drops can do that too. These mana costs are so low, low, low. If they were any cheaper, they'd be free. So it's time to win big by thinking small as the Command Zone presents the best one drops in Commander. Besides Soul Ring. Yo, what's up? You know, Jimmy, I've been thinking, wouldn't it be awesome to get a chance to play Magic with Post Malone? Wait, we do play Magic with Post Malone. Yeah, I'm not talking about you or me. I'm talking about the fans. Oh, that's right. So WhatNot and Post Malone, they've teamed up to give one lucky winner a chance to play Posty in a one-on-one -on -one game of Commander in person here in Los Angeles. But get this, this is the craziest part. The winner gets $100,000. Holy moly. All you have to do is download the WhatNot app, subscribe to Post Malone's channel, and then be there on his stream August 4th at 6 p.m. Pacific for your chance to win. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. Make sure that you bookmark Posty's stream so that you can be there the moment it goes live. Because the important part here is you have to be there during the actual stream on August 4th at 6 p.m. Pacific in order to be eligible to win the chance to play in that match for 100 grand. Yeah, seriously, playing Post Malone in Magic, it's the best. Yeah, it absolutely is. But winning $100,000, I think is even better. Yeah, but you're gonna have to have a WhatNot account, so make sure you download the app and follow Post Malone. Be there August 4th, 6 p.m. Pacific. For more information, go to postmalone.whatnot.com. That's postmalone.whatnot.com. We will have all of those links in the show notes if you can't remember. Postmalone.whatnot.com. Again, August 4th, 6 p.m. Pacific. You want to win $100,000, right? Yeah, and also you get to meet us because we'll be there too if you do happen to win. Oh, that's right. We're going to be at the event. Yeah. I wish I could play for $100,000. Nah, let's give it to one of the fans. So good luck out there, everyone. We'll hopefully see you soon. Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. What's up, everybody? You're watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I am one of your hosts today, Jimmy Wong. And I'm DJ. DJ! You know, do you ever have those keyboards back in the day? I think I've talked to you about this before where you press the button and then say, DJ! DJ! I did not! What? Okay, I need one of those. They were classic, like sure. those electronic Casio, like low keyboards. There's always one key on the drum set that would go, DJ! So every time I see your name, I think of that. <laughs> That's a good thing to think about. I like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's fun. It's, it's light hard. DJ! Uh, so... Commander is obviously a format that's dominated by big, splashy spells and crazy combos, but today, we'd like you to consider the humble one drop. Actually, not so humble. One drops are very important <laughs> in Magic and Commander, so we're going to talk about the best one mana spells in Commander. Except... Soul Ring. We're not talking about Soul Ring today. No, 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 no. We can all agree Soul Ring's just pretty <laughs> okay. Uh, but before we get into it, we're going to be talking about a lot of cards today. You may want to pick up some of those cards. So our sponsors for the show, channelfireball.com slash command. They have their own marketplace. There you can buy singles, sealed products, and more. Get some great deals shot from local game stores across the country. And most importantly, get the cards that you need for your deck because we're talking about one drops. One drops are incredibly powerful if used correctly. It's a great way to make your deck just better, just right just easily take out a high drop put in the one drop you're gonna have a lot of fun uh, and when you get those cards sleeve them up go to shop.ultrapro.com slash command that's our affiliate link for ultra pro's store i really do highly recommend you check it out there is so much stuff to get from that store they have stuff not just from magic the gathering but other card games that they have the licenses to so you'll find some amazing art sleeves deck boxes play mats you name it and they're always having sales as well uh, every time i get something off the ultra pro sale store it's, sometimes it's like 20 percent off sometimes it's 50% off. I can't believe the deals I'm getting. Um, and then you're going to get the stuff to protect your cards. Josh and I have trusted this for many, many years, decades, in fact. Uh, and we continue to trust it. And we hope you do too. So shop.ultrapro.com slash command to get some great deals. And finally, patreon.com slash command zone, the best way to support the show because it's direct straight to us. And we shout out one lucky patron every single week. And this week's episode is dedicated to Mark Michaud. Michaud. Mark. You rock. Thanks, Mark. And one last thing before we get into it. We actually have our own online store. 
Uh, it's at store.commandzone.com. Just check it out. We got some a t-shirt, a hat, and some stickers. You may have actually seen, uh, it's not behind us right now, but we have some stickers that say spicy and salty to, to match with our brand, of course. So check that out. Lots of good stuff there. And if you're a patron, you actually get some discounts as well. Okay, DJ, what are we talking about today? So we're talking about one drops, but... Are one drops really that important? Does it deserve an entire episode? This is a battle cruiser <laughs> format, right? Yeah, kind of. You sometimes. know, like yeah. you know, we're we're here to commanders the place where you play your eight drops, right? Yeah, yeah. Your eight drops are the ones that win you the game, and you're basically playing nothing until then, right? I feel like some people are ignoring the one drops, though. I feel like they're like, okay, we we ramp on two, we hit we hit this, and right. there's nothing like, there's, on one. Yeah, there's and there's not really much room for for one drops, but. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> We're here to tell you that one drops are really good and can be really critical in your deck. Yeah, one drops rock. We talk a lot about sort of removal spells with Path to Exile, Swords of Plowshares, or counter spells. You know, everyone knows Josh loves Swan Song, mm -hmm. but we have a lot of other one drops in Magic's history. And why are they so important? So there's three sort of key things that we honed in on. First is just straight up efficiency. Outside of a zero mana spell, one mana is the cheapest a card can cost. There's now half mana cards, right? These spells... Little girl. Little girl, that's right. Yeah, yeah, something from uh, from an unset. Or there's like pie, I guess. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> uh, but if, if you're talking about efficiency, like you mentioned um, Path to Exile, right? Yeah. So if Path to Exile is killing something, it's usually going to be killing something bigger than it. You are spending less mana to answer that threat. Yeah. Swan Song. Like you are spending one mana to counter something usually bigger than you and you are saving mana, the efficiency on these cards are, are just out of control because all the ones that we're naming, they do have big effects. Yeah, you know? exactly. Worthwhile effects to have in Commander and being so low costed, it means that you have more room to deploy other things. Yeah, so I tap out for six, I play something big, DJ goes, ooh, well, I left one mana open, Swan Song, you get a 2-2 two -two bird instead. Yeah. I've wasted my entire turn, and DJ, on his turn, was able to do a bunch of other things. So efficient, because I've I've basically time-walked you for one. I've like interrupted your entire play. It's yeah. great, great efficiency. Yeah, and that leads to our second point, which is the curve. So one drops fit so well into any curve how many times have you been playing magic dj and you tap out and you realize oh gosh i just have one mana left over and nothing to do with it yeah all the time i mean you want to you want to play the cards that you want to but you get the most out of your turn when you use all of your mana yeah and so having one drops being able to fill in so you play what you want but you still have the ability to follow up with that one drop could mean that you're using all your mana every turn yeah and i you know or you hold it up for some interaction no one knows what you have because there are a lot of versatile one drops out there but so many times i've played ramp on two or three go to my next turn i have four or five mana and i look at my hand and go well i can cast two two drops and oh, i'm just missing out i wish i had the two and the three drop but if you have more one drops in your deck that helps fill out your curve and always make sure you're playing the most cards and as we said in the show if you're playing more cards than everyone else at the table there's a good chance you're winning that game mm -hmm. uh finally interaction we've already mentioned this a bunch of time but cheap interaction is great and it also means you're okay if i do pass with one mana up it goes all the way around i'm holding up my path nothing happens shrug not it's not that deal. big of a deal right not that big of a deal yeah yeah as opposed to i have a six mana situational counter spell pass around the turn hope someone plays the thing so i can get them no one does anything you're actually priced into just b blowing it on anything at that point in time because you yeah. can't just like keep all of your mana up for an entire turn one mana easy easy you know and you can still play your game of magic deploy things to the board do your your plan you know yeah. what i mean yeah, yeah yeah and keep up one mana you know but as soon as you're holding up you know that spell swindle at five. Oh ooh, gosh you just gotta you just gotta use it or else you're back you're behind so much and what if your other opponents are also reactive decks and they're just passing with their mana open mm -hmm. you know then you're really in a tough spot and you hate it you start to sweat more bullets after the first person goes okay they didn't do anything maybe the next person will oh darn they didn't do anything okay the third person if they don't do something i'm really out of tempo here that means that one drops can be more um uh, situational than mm -hmm. other cards. Ah, you know? yeah. They have more flexibility because their mana is so low. Uh, they can be more narrow. They can um, they can answer more questions, kind of thing. Yeah, 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 I like that. Actually, I like that. That could be our fourth point, which is they can be a more narrow answer because you don't feel so bad if your nature's claim doesn't get used. You just save it for another turn. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we went through, uh, we decided to format this uh, episode and make our selections. There were a lot of things that we had to consider. Basically, for one. We did not add any one drops that need a lot of support to make them powerful, or if they are large mana sinks. Yeah. So, so for example, Fireball 
is mm-hmm. technically a one drop. It costs one X X and a red mana. Yep. Deal X damage. You know what? You like could that. cast it though for just red and yeah, deal you no could. damage. <laughs> you could. But the thing is, is it really a one drop? No. Yeah. Like it's it's an X spell. You have to sink a lot of extra mana into it, and in which case it's not truly a one drop. So yep. it doesn't get counted. Yeah. Similarly, Hex Trinker as well. Uh, it is a powerful creature for one mana, but you have to invest a lot of mana into it to level it up to get it to that level. So on its base, it's actually not a one drop one mana, that two, we want to talk about. Yeah, yeah, with with potential, but you need the extra mana to make it truly powerful. Yeah, same goes for like cards like Figure of Destiny and stuff. Yeah, um, uh, Phyrexian Dreadnought. Oh, that's a one drop. It's a one drop. Incredibly powerful. I believe too narrow because you need to abuse it in some way in order to actually like it's a combo piece. Yeah, you, you know? have to sacrifice creatures equaling twelve power, a bunch of other stuff to play it, and that's not what. Or you, you want. just stick it in your graveyard, you scavenge it on something, or yeah, you know, yeah. plasma back. There's there's lots of different synergies with it. It's definitely powerful when it's used, but. You know, it's too narrow yeah. for this kind of play one drops episode. Yep, exactly. Uh, and so then we took our choices and categorized them by general category. So we've got ramp, card draw, tutors, all that stuff. To be honest, Jimmy, I thought that we were just going to get like 20 cards. And be like, <laughs> just, talk about just, 20. just talk about 20 cards. Yeah. Like your favorite 10, my favorite 10. No, too many, too many good one drops. Yeah. The so we m- had to break them up into categories. The moment you started listing them all out, it was like, uh oh, we can't just do a straight list. Uh, so we from there, then we narrowed it down even more. And then we have sort of for each of them, it depends. Some of them we have a couple of selections for some of them we have like Mm -hmm. six or seven and then of course we're going to decide our best and finally we did not have a budget restriction for this one drops are cards that you'll typically see played in cedh or legacy formats because they're so darn efficient but that doesn't mean they're all out of price budget uh there are a bunch that you can actually get for a decent amount but we did not include budget as a concern when it came to determining these because we're just looking to find the best one drops Mm mm-hmm All right, so with that, let's jump right into the categories. The first is the most classic in Commander. It's Ramp. Now, Soul Ring, we've already talked about. This is the thing that jumps to everyone's minds when they think about one-drop Ramp. But we're not here to talk about that crap. No. It it starts our show with an animation, but we don't need it. Turn one Soul Ring, that's awful. Uh, there are actually a lot of options in this category. More than I actually was really surprised. I thought Soul Ring was the big baddie and there was nothing else to really compete with it. But turns out there's a ton. Yeah, and I actually was thinking about, like in the back of my head, oh, Mana Dorks, you know, right. the Land of War Elves, Birds the Birds of Paradise, Paradise and yeah. stuff like that. Um, but those really didn't uh, hit me as the most powerful, the thing I absolutely want to do. In fact, I've been a little bit uh, underwhelmed with them recently. They seem really? to always get caught up in board wipes and, uh, you know, Oh, yeah. just removed pretty easily. Yeah, um, yeah. You put, play a bunch of them by turn five, someone boards wipes, and then all of a sudden you are behind. But do you know what I've really enjoyed is some of these enchantments that uh, produce mana. Enchantments. In fact, there's only one creature on this list, so let's go through the enchantments first. The first one up is a CEDH staple, right? Mm-hmm. It's the Carpet of Flowers, everybody. Woo! At the beginning of your, each of your main phases, if you haven't added mana with this ability this turn, you may add X mana of any one color where X is the number of islands target opponent controls. Okay. I love that this can actually, you can play it, and then you can pass through combat in your second main phase, you can immediately start adding mana. Right, that same turn. That's crazy. That means a lot of times you're, this is free, just free mana. Yeah. Now, yeah, Jimmy. Yeah. Are you concerned that your opponents are not playing islands? You know, in my meta and play group, not terribly so. <laughs> if anything, I would be concerned that players are playing too many colors and their only islands are like a watery gray. And a triome or something yeah, like that. Triome, so there's only so two, yeah. two. But still, you get two extra mana every turn from Carpet of Flowers. And you get, again, that decision if you want to go to combat and wait for your second main phase or just use it in your first main phase. Um, if this is played on turn one over the course of like a nine turn game, I could see this adding anywhere up to... Jeez, 20, more than Soul Ring, like way more 25, than 25, 30 mana, depending on what your opponents are playing. So there's a reason that's really big in CDH because everyone runs interaction and blue is a very heavily played color. So Carpet of the Flowers just does work. I think it does enough work that if you ever happen to run across a table where there's no islands, you're fine because it's such a play powerhouse it, yeah. in other in other decks. Yeah, and this recently got secret layer reprinting, so it's actually not terribly expensive. It's great though, you're right, because you could go draw this on turn six, play it on your first main phase, your second main phase happens, you point at someone else, they have seven islands out. Oh. You just get seven mana for one mana on that same turn. It's crazy. Very good, yeah. So that one's definitely up there as one of the most powerful. 
All right, Jimmy, this is one that I added and I wanted your opinion on it. Okay. It's Curse of Opulence. Ah, It's classic. one red mana for an aura curse enchant player. Whenever enchanted player is attacked, create a gold token. Each opponent attacking that player does the same. Okay, gold tokens are basically treasures, except they do not require you to tap them to sacrifice to add a mana of any color. I put this on the player. Every time I swing at them, I get a gold, but also everyone else swinging at them gets gold. So that is ramp, technically. Yeah. I get to attack you and get a extra mana, but so does every player at the table. This is very. I mean, dependent. if everyone's if everyone's attacking the one player, number one, they're not attacking you. Yeah, so that's a little that's a side b- bonus outside of just the ramp that you're getting. Uh, you are ramping other players, but you're also getting that ramp along with it. So is that is that fine? It is asymmetrical because the person cursed by the curse of opulence doesn't get that ability unless they find some magical way to attack themselves. They probably can't. Uh, all of your opponents benefiting from it though does seem a little scary. Um, and at some point, if your deck isn't trying to, you know, you have a bunch of death touch or whatever, it's going to be hard potentially for you to swing in at that player. Now you're probably playing another player that you think isn't going to put up too many blockers. And this also disappears if the player leaves the game. So I, I like this card, but it feels a bit more casual, especially compared to the old Carpet of Flowers. Yeah, it's hard to com- it's hard to compare it to Carpet of Flowers. It's hard to compare, but I will say that if you're going for an absolute budget version, Curse of Opulence is something that can do a lot of work. I gotta say, there are other commander uh, content creators out there that think that uh, Curse of Opulence is like super broken. It's like one oh, of the best really? one drop uh, auras out there. It so that's why I kind of wanted your opinion about it. I definitely agree with the idea that if you play it early, it can twist the game because everyone's like, well, why am I not attacking you? I'm just gonna get free mana off of it and that person's gonna be forced to make bad blocks and all that stuff. So it is great for deterring maybe a little bit of action Mm -hmm. but there are a lot of downsides here uh so i do think that while it's good it's not great you never like giving the control to your opponents to be able to ramp themselves because it 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 synergizes with their game plan maybe a little bit better than yours yeah and maybe you have an attacking creature based strategy and uh they with their spells strategy or something a little bit more powerful might use the gold a little bit more yeah but they also may not have the creatures to attack Mm -hmm. so i do think it is situational because you don't want to put this in the deck where you don't have creatures that's for sure you want to trigger it yeah you you i mean if you're playing this just to have your opponents attack your opponent then just play goad cards don't don't play curse of opulence i think Mm mm-hmm all Good right. call. Next up, we have Exploration. It's one green mana. Uh, you may play an additional land on each of your turns. All right, so this is like, you know, you've got your Oracle of Moldias. You've got so many different cards that allow you to play extra lands. Oracle's obviously one of the better ones, but Exploration is just one mana. You could get off to a pretty explosive start with this. And getting lands on the battlefield is one of the best ways to ramp because they're rarely interacted with. Yeah, so turn one, play Exploration, play another land. Turn two comes around, play two more lands. That's four lands on the battlefield. Now you have almost no hand left yeah like what kind of hand did you keep you know four lands exploration like where are you going to go from there i think that's one of the downsides of this kind of card is that you need the card draw too to supplement it or else you're just going to run out of lands and it didn't truly ramp you that much yeah that's a really hard opening hand to to get right you're going for seven cards you want three to four of them to be lands as well as exploration as well as a card draw spell that's cheap that you can cast early but if you have the right combination that's crazy because yeah. if you just keep drawing and feeding lands onto the battlefield it can really really ramp you yeah and i would say a lot of decks out there are landfall decks and that extra land drop they're taking any kind of ability that gives them that effect because it adds up too right better you with have... bounce lands too we just got a bounce oh, land yeah. reprinting. better with bounce lands um good with uh some other some other sort of lands drops yeah, too as yeah. well but very dependent like we said on early card draw same with this next one it's burgeoning mm-hmm. it's a green mana for an enchantment whenever an opponent plays a land you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield so it has to be playing a land can't be like a fetch land or whatever entering the battlefield uh and you need again to have those lands but you play this on turn one it goes around you could technically have four lands by the time it gets back to you i think it's that initial big push that's uh that's very powerful and exciting but then people with burgeoning often run out of lands yeah and as you deploy all your lands, you feel great, but then you miss your land drop, Mm -hmm. you know, and it goes around again and you miss your land drop and suddenly you're not accelerated, you know, three lands ahead. Now you're kind of caught up with everyone else. Yeah. You know, when it comes to ramp, if you ever, if you're ramping, that's great. But if you then miss your land drop, it undoes your ramping. Yeah, yeah. So I definitely think it's really, really important to have either of these cards with a bunch of card draw. Otherwise, they're a bit of a trap. Uh, I think people see this and go, wow, that's so powerful and forget sort of the circumstances that need to happen in order to get there. Uh, Okay, let's talk about the only creature on this list. 
It is what we like to call the Planeswalker creature. It's Deathrite Shaman. So this is a black or a green for a 1-2 elf shaman, and you can do three abilities on him, like a Planeswalker. You can tap it to exile a land from a graveyard, and you add a man of any color to your mana pool. So goodbye fetch lands, evolving wilds, all that stuff that gets stuck in players' uh, graveyards early. You can also pay a black and tap it to exile target instant or sorcery card, and each opponent loses two life. And then you can pay a green to tap it to exile a creature card, and you gain two life. So it's got a little bit of graveyard hate on it, a little bit of drain, a little bit of life gain. But the top ability is that you're able to tap it to get a land out and then add a man to your mana pool. So for a while, I thought that Deathrite Shaman was a little bit underwhelming. I didn't think that there was a much uh, as often reliable. I don't think that people were reliably putting lands in their graveyards oh, unless you were on. at like top end tables where everyone's running fetch fetches, lands. Fetches, fetches, Yeah, I was playing against a lot of people that had normal mana bases and they just had an evolving wilds. Right. And it wasn't reliable enough for my two or three fetch lands to be able to be worth it. But we've got like Prismatic Visto. We've uh, got yeah. we've got we've got the the new lands that immediately sacrifice themselves and put them in the graveyard. We have a lot more uh searching and fetching out there than we used to and so I think that Deathrite Shaman is a more reliable mana dork than it used to be and so I think that a lot of people uh, should be putting into their decks. I like that and we've seen now Wizards is happy to start reprinting fetch lands as they understand how important they are. Yeah, I they're think. not $100. I mean... <laughs> in general <laughs> when, are you, when are we watching this but yeah. <laughs> in general they're not a hundred dollars and but for a while a lot of people are like well it's not i'm not yeah. gonna spend a hundred dollars on a land, on a land yeah. yeah even i'm not gonna spend twenty dollars on a land but we see now like you said right prismatic vista uh there's the other one that when the enters when battlefield four, four lands yeah, yeah i forget the name but there's a lot of different ways now to start fetching for stuff um so it's pretty cool i think death right chairman definitely has its place but golgari means that it has to go in the deck with black and green mm -hmm. and it's commander color identity i do like uh, being able to target graveyards. I think that way too much broken stuff happens in the graveyard yep. and being able to spend a single mana to answer that uh, is really good. So this is... Yeah. Uh, I, I almost like Deathrite Shaman more for the other two abilities mm -hmm. that it can threaten doing something to get rid of a, you know, a past in flames or something scary in someone's graveyard. So... The drain ability hits everyone too. So at the yeah. end of a game, this can start adding up. Yeah, totally. Uh, okay, the next two cards are really similar. It's Wild Growth and Utopia Sprawl. Uh, these are enchantment effects that are played onto lands are definitely a little bit more resilient uh, than just getting, you know, a Mandork out there. So Wild Growth only adds green, but it can enchant any land when you tap that land for mana. And Utopia Sprawl, it adds any color, but it can only enchant a forest-type land. So really similar. Um, I love both of these. We all know that Josh Lee Kwai is a huge fan as well. We actually just recently played a game against your Enchantress deck where you use these types of enchantments to great effect. Yes. So what do you uh, think about them? I think that they're amazing, and I think that having them in an Enchantress deck is great because they trigger all these other extra synergies. Yeah. But... I think that they're just great in just a normal ramp deck. I think so too. Just being able to, number one, these dorks have haste. So if in the late game, if you draw it, you can pay a green to put it on an untapped land and then that will then produce extra mana. And yep. so- And you made that mana cost back all already. Yeah, you've already gotten it back. So that's really strong. But most importantly, I feel like there's a lot of interaction in our play group. There's a lot of board wipes. There's a lot of answers, yeah. you know, and a lot of mana dorks just get swept up in those answers and less so when it comes to enchantments. And so when I play my ramp, I want it to stick around. Uh, so I get the most advantage out of it. And yep. these enchantments stick around better than a mana dork. Yeah, a hundred percent. So now we've talked about a bunch of cards here for ramp. What is our pick for best one drop ramp? For me, it's pretty easy. For me, it's pretty easy. It's definitely Carpet, Carpet of, of Flowers. Flowers. Yeah, this is, uh, it's it's carpeting the rest of them in terms of how good it is comparatively. Just so much mana. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Just always, it's always generating a ton of mana. Yeah. Sometimes it'll generate uh, way more than any of these cards will even do in a single game, right? Like, again, we've talked about Carpet of Flowers. If you're playing against a mono blue deck, oh, ho, you are in business. Yeah. Wild Growth and Utopia Sprawl, though, I think take a close second for me, as well as Deathrite Shaman. Uh, Deathrite Shaman just goes down just a little bit because of the color identity thing. Um, but I really like Utopia Sprawl uh, and Wild Growth. Both of those cards, I think people could definitely play more in each of their decks, and it would make them better, for sure. Sounds good. All right. All right let's, let's keep talking about mana, but this time we're going to talk about ephemeral mana. Let's talk about rituals. Ooh, ephemeral mana. Yes. That sounds like a card <laughs> that Ooh, doesn't I exist like that. yet. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so getting big influxes of mana can make a big difference in your game. Game. Sometimes it only takes a single turn of going off, of playing multiple spells yep. to swing the game in your favor. Or just and win outright. Absolutely. And so sometimes getting big amounts of mana for a single turn 
is really incredibly powerful. And mm -hmm. there's some one drops that help us get there. All right, so the first is again a classic, uh, both for CEDH and for Storm decks. It's High Tide. It's a blue mana for an instant until end of turn whenever a player taps an island for mana, they add an additional man blue mana to their mana pool. Can I add another card to this conversation? Sure. Bubbling Muck is a single mana. It's a black mana, and it says until end of turn whenever a player taps a swamp for uh. mana, it produces an additional black. Okay, all right, cool. So Bubbling Muck is the black version that's a sorcery. Sorcery, And yeah. High Tide is the blue version that's an instant. Both very powerful. We see this as a huge uh, card in Storm because it gives you double the mana for that turn only. Tap all your stuff, cast all your spells, add Storm Count 1. Now your opponents also get the effects, it appears. Uh, and it's also any kind of island, so it could, again, be that watery grave or whatever. But High Tide can generate a lot of mana. So... In Storm, this is just amazing. You know what I mean? I, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, that you're going off, you're chaining spells together. It's a very specific, kind of a narrow strategy. Yeah. Are these cards good enough just in, well, I'm going to cast this on turn five oh. and then play an eight drop? Yeah, it's an interesting thing because when you say it like that, I'm like, yeah, I like that. High Tide into Insurrection or High, <laughs> not sorry, Insurrection. High Tide into Expropriate is a little bit more appropriate. Yeah. Uh, but... You have to be in a deck that runs a lot of violence for High Tide and a lot of Swamps for Bubbling Muck. So it's the same way that Cabal Coffer is, is not amazing in a five-color deck. High Tide is pretty bad in a five-color deck as well. So it's a little more narrow. Um, I, I do like that scenario, though, but I feel like these types of spells are better served winning you the game with Storm and a Brain Freeze or whatever it is. Mm. So does it belong in this generic one drop? These are good one drops or is this like, oh, this is pretty narrow now. This is just for Storm. It seems I mean, I situational have... because it's also just for decks that have a lot of the island or the uh, swamp. Mm. So even though we we know that these are powerful, we kind of, just like Deathrite Shaman got a few points taken off because it's Golgari. These got right. a few points taken off because they're for very specific styles of decks. Yeah, it's interesting because High Tide compared to Carpet of Flowers, it's like, well, you just said Carpet of Flowers is good because someone's going to have a lot of islands, but that's because you're depending on three other players to potentially have enough islands, and they don't even need to have that many. They could have three, and Carpet of Flowers is very good. High Tide requires you to be playing a deck that has at least, I think, 50% of your lands uh, as islands or can count as islands for it to really be effective. So the, the rituals in general, by the way, are giving you just a tiny bit of mana for a one-off effect, and if you can support it with a ton of card draw, like Storm decks do, yep. you know, then I think that it can be a good return on investment uh which is which leads me to believe that high tide might be okay but i, I in a regular non-storm in deck. a regular non-storm deck but i'm wondering also uh th about the ability to have that big card as well like do you have a critical mass of big cards that line up perfectly with high tide right. that lets you really get your maximum ramping on um i've liked bubbling muck a little bit more in black decks because i feel like i have more uh, outlets for it right you know i have like the torment of Hailfire, yeah, yeah or yeah. the drain life or something like that okay i like that there are also a lot of mono black decks or or black and white decks that are, rely heavily on those cabal coffers urborg type effects so and the, urborg more likely to have critical mass of yeah swaps. yeah i think bubbling muck is actually better because urborg exists and mm. we know that a lot of mono black or black heavy decks are out there and have more than just one card that supported outside bubbling muck so i'm actually a bigger fan now a bubbling muck in general unless you're playing storm in which high tide because you need blue is going to be better interesting so these two cards were anticipating adding four or five extra mana what if it's only a couple mana what if it's dark ritual a single uh, black for an instant add three mana to your mana pool i like dark ritual in general better because you can play it in any deck that has black and then you can use that black mana instantly you don't have to have islands or swamps in order to have so that if it's like boost. grixis storm like you'd rather have a, a dark ritual Ooh, grixis storm man now you're mixing them all up <laughs> this cake is getting the batter's getting thick uh yeah i don't know actually i i, I play dark ritual so i can get like necropotent down turn one or play a bull oh citadel. so you would just like you do like it in just a black deck where you're like i'm just want i just need my bullet citadel out when people aren't expecting it yeah you know well i will say turn that black, four added two extra mana bullets to citadel yeah because black mana black cards in black decks usually have the most requirement to have a bunch of black pips so i see dark ritual as being more useful in those scenarios mm -hmm. but i've also seen people just use it to play you know a three mana ramp spell at the same turn or to do something that just gives them a little bit of advantage draws starts drawing them cards or whatever and just that small pump i think is great because it doesn't require anything but the spell itself uh i like being able to 
play my hypnotic specter on turn one. Oh, and so I, <laughs> hypnotic and so specter. I have, I have, the I do classic. Have a, I, do have a, I do have a deck where I have dark ritual and hypnotic specter in the hopes that I can <laughs> play, play that classic one, two punch on turn one. That is where dark <laughs> ritual really started getting its name. But yeah. Uh, and again, all of these spells we might add are great when you can cast them again from the graveyard. So if you mm. have that synergy, then of course these spells go up in value. Now this next one's really interesting because when you put this down, I was like, this is not a ritual. And then I looked at it and went, this is a ritual. <laughs> It's Mana Vault. So Mana Vault's a one mana artifact. It doesn't untap during an untap step, and you can pay th- uh, four during, at the beginning of your upkeep to untap it, but only then. It's an awkward time to untap your Yeah, your because that's your, you want to wait on the end step so you can untap those lands, uh, but then you uh, can tap it to add three mana, three colorless mana. So this is, I we saw it with Josh's Shorakai deck in the Game Nights episode with uh, Posty, and he was able to get his Shorakai out but he had tons of different ways like unwinding clock to untap it every single turn. Mm. So I do like Mana Vault in the eyes of being a ritual. There are games where I play it, use it, and never untap it for the rest of the game. Yeah, or when you do untap it, like it's at a point in the game where you're like, all right, I don't have very it, much else going on right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Know? And that's not a good feeling. Um, but you get but it's, to use the it. most of its power comes not from the second time you use it, but the first time you use it. Like that's where a lot of the power comes from. Yeah, because one for three is... A big burst. And so maybe that gives more credence to Dark Ritual being better than Bubbling Muck or High Tide in a vacuum because you get that instant boost and that's what you needed at that moment, not... I'm going to try and use this to win the game. I like that Mana Vault, you can invest in it early and then boost next turn, giving you an extra mana. So for example, Uh, Dark Ritual on turn two will get you to four mana, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, because you have to play it on turn two to get up that two extra mana. Mana Vault, you can play it on turn one, then on turn two, it'll get you up to five mana. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. That one mana investment that you can then save up and then boom, it becomes a little bit more explosive. The more mana that you can get on earlier turns, the more explosive you can get. And so Mana Vault is of all of these, the most explosive. Yeah, I like that. All right, the last two we'll talk about, uh, one of them is extremely prohibitively expensive, so don't get it and don't think (laughs) about it. But the other is the creature version of it. Uh, It's Candelabra of Thanos and then Magus of the Candelabra. So Candelabra of Thanos is pretty simple. It's a one mana artifact. You pay X to untap it to, oh, you do untap it, to untap X separate lands. Yeah. Uh, so basically, Candelabra of Taunus only generates mana if your lands produce more than one mana. So yep, if you, like those bounce lands? Yeah, if you've high tided, you know what I mean, oh, and all your lands okay. produce produce two mana, then you know you can tap four mana to untap four lands, and those four lands can produce eight, eight. mana. Eight, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Magus of the Candelabra is really similar. It's a green creature, and you can pay X and tap it to untap X target lands. So similar, but you have to tap this creature. Again, this is only in decks that really can use those extra lands. I've seen this do busted things where you have your lands producing a lot of mana and you're tapping and untapping. They produce just ex- exponential amounts of mm. mana, but I think that they're too narrow and that you shouldn't even worry about feeling bad about not being able to afford Candelabra of Tano. It's just yeah, too narrow. It doesn't, matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, let's talk about our pick for the best one drop ritual. My brain is melting now because I don't actually know which one I want to pick here. I think Mana Vault is the best, but I don't know if I like it the most. I think I'm going to go with Bubbling Muck as my favorite. Okay. uh, Because I like that big amount of black mana, and I think that uh, black has a lot of ways to use those big drops, and I'm also not really storming out as much. I think that I can just value into a Bolus of Citadel or something. Yeah, yeah. I think more decks that are running, again, the Cabal Coffers, Orberg, Orberg, all those combos should have Bubbling Muck as another way to generate a bunch of mana. But I like Dark Rich because I think you can put it into any deck and it will be able to cast lots of great things. And it, you know, as long as the deck has black in it, I think Dark Ritual has the most flexibility. So it's going to get my vote there. Uh, and of course, Mana Vault's great too, but a little more prohibitively expensive. So I don't actually love that. Um, I do like, again, playing Necropotence <laughs> off, of, uh, <laughs> off of a Dark Ritual. Right, okay. So a lot of the things that we've been talking about, like they're, they're, we use a card to produce a lot of mana. Mm-hmm. Uh, this doesn't work if we don't have a critical mass of cards in general. Yeah. Like in order to use this stuff, you know? So yeah, how we bad need a card is... draw to supplement all of this stuff, like the explorations, Correct. the burgeonings. Yeah, we yeah, said yeah. we need card draw to supplement it. You know, we're spending cards on just little bits of ramp or bursts of mana. We need the cards to deploy as well. So card draw is the second half of ramp that comes together and makes your deck really start functioning. Yep. And a lot of card draw is not actually card draw they're like cantrips so it'll you play it for a blue and it's opt it's you know and you scry 
try or whatever and you draw a card so it replaces itself we don't count that as card draw we're talking about cards that can draw you multiple cards across the course yeah. of the game filtering i think is very good and card selection is good but we want we want to be up on cards yep exactly same goes for looting and all that stuff mm -hmm. so let's kick things off with another cedh staple one that you all know very well it's mystic remora a blue for an enchantment with a cumulative upkeep of one. Whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, you may draw a card unless that player pays four mana. Ooh. So basically every single time. Have you ever paid four, Jimmy? Never. Are you <laughs> kidding me? Oh my gosh. Four two, is so much. Two is one thing. One is one thing. Four is out of control. Do you ever sandbag your ramp? Like, let's say that oh, you're, gosh. yeah, mi someone plays an early Mystic Remora trying to get those, uh, you know, those signets or that ramp. Do you ever sandbag and be like, no, I'm not going to give you the card? Hell no. <laughs> you just play, yeah. Okay. You have to just give people, the, because what are you doing? You're putting yourself down how much they may, there's a chance they don't draw anything that they use for the rest of the game. There's a chance that they draw something that only affects That's another optimistic. player. You're, yeah, you're it's like, very you're optimistic. You're like, they're just going to draw lands. That's but, all of these triggers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but thinking that they're, that you would rather than them not draw anything and you're going to hurt yourself to do so you know there's this uh interesting chinese phrase and saying my dad taught me the other week which is if you're not selfish then both heaven and earth will conspire to destroy you which is deep, a, jimmy you just got deep it's here. a very conservative <laughs> thought right typically we're taught to be sharing and caring and all that stuff but this is something i think really applies to magic which is you can't sacrifice your own development of your board plan because everything is going to start hurting you at that point so doing nothing ugh, tough Okay. Uh, I think it's fantastic. What do you think about that cumulative upkeep? Is that prohibitive? So a lot of times people will play this on turn one and everyone's not CEDH enough to be playing on creature spells on their first turn. So they'll go their first turn and go, all right, I'll pay another man for it. I think this is really good in high power tables because you're probably gonna draw two, three cards in rotation. And it's actually not bad later on in the game. You cast this turn four or five. There's a good chance you'll still draw that many cards. Because four is so much. Yeah, it's, it's so, so much. much. Uh, and at that point too, you're not too crazy to pay the cumulative upkeep. I think at that point, right? It's like, oh, I paid two mana for a Mystic Remora and it's gonna draw me four cards that i think is pretty good also people would rather have it just go away in general rather than use a card on it too right. so i think that people are more likely to let it go around and just be like look it'll go away eventually yeah they'll they'll stop paying for it eventually it's not like a ristic study that could sit around for a long long time all right next up we have a recent addition to the magic commander lexicon uh it's esper sentinel Oof, this esper card. sentinel is this fantastic card is nuts esper sentinel is a white mana for a one one artifact creature human soldier whenever an opponent can cast their first non-creature spell each turn, draw a card unless that player pays X where X is Esper Sentinel's power. Okay, so the tax is typically almost always just one. Don't you love how the difference between Mystic Remora and Esper Sentinel is like so, such a big difference? You can tell, like, yeah. But we're still like, oh, Esper Sentinel. It's, it's amazing. It's so good, yeah, yeah. But I that's mean, the difference between blue and white, new cards and old cards. Yeah, exactly. They're, these cards are like, what, 20 years apart? Uh, Esper Sentinel only also lets you draw up to one card a turn. Uh, and so... And usually it's tax of one. A tax of one. Which is way more pay payable. Way more payable. Obviously, we don't pay it as often as probably we should, but... It is way more payable. It's a bit more fair, uh, but it's still extremely powerful. It's also an artifact. It goes into so many artifact deck synergies. Mm -hmm. Equipment decks can make that power go up. And you typically see this more in like the more constructed uh, formats. But I think Esper Sentinel has a ton of potential to just be a white staple forever. Yeah, this forever. is also the first white creature that we've been looking at. So I want to mention uh, Ranger of Eos that fetches it. Ranger mm -hmm. Captain of Eos that fetches it. Earth like things Saga like, also fetches oh, it. Yeah, Militia Bugler or like uh, a lot yeah, of these yeah, other yeah. small things it triggers Mentor the Meek. And so white has a little bit of a strategy that deals with smaller things. And so Esper Sentinel might be a synergistic piece along with the card drop piece too. Yeah, Recruiter of the Guard also grabs it as well. Yeah. So there's a lot of ways that white can grab this up and it for that you know alone i think is really really powerful uh, you can also augment the power of this so that if you're more likely to draw a card oh yeah. you suit it up with a sword of and suddenly they have <laughs> to pay three instead of one and that becomes a little bit easier to get your card drag on and they have to get embarrassed by the fact that esper sentinel smacking them <laughs> and untapping all your lands or whatever um yeah great card though can't be understated enough and it turns out we have another white card in the card draw category which is kind of crazy if you think about it you would think oh what card draw in Commander at one drops, there's only going to be blue and green or whatever. No, actually, white dominates this category. Land tax is the next one. White mana enchantment at the beginning of your upkeep. If an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for up to three basic land cards. Reveal them, put them into your hand, and shuffle your library. 
So people th- see land on a card and they're like, oh, it has to do with ramp. But no, you are j- literally drawing these cards yep. and lands are cards to everyone. Don't discriminate. Lands oh, are cards definitely too. cards too. Yeah. Land text <laughs> could also say you may search your, you know, or like you draw three cards. They have to be basic lands is kind of what, you know, you can retranslate it to. Um, typically in a game, if you're not first, you're going to fall behind on lands. And if you don't have your own ramp or your own, you know, exploration burgeonings, you're going to mm-hmm. stay behind. I've drawn 12 cards off of this thing before. Yep, and it's great. You just get keep getting lands, keep getting lands, keep getting lands. Even you're okay if you're pitching them, them away, that's yeah, totally, totally fine. fine. It's totally fine. And you're you know at that point taking 12 cards out of your deck is significant enough to consider like I think you're thinning it out and increasing your general draws and you're never ever going to miss a land drop. And Never. missing a land drop again undoes a lot of the ramp that you've included. Your deck. If you have 10 sources of ramp in your deck, missing yeah. a land drop is like ridiculous. And so with land tax, you're always hitting it. You're staying on curve with everyone else. Okay. Uh, land tax though. Can't say enough. Obviously very good in certain situations. Uh, you do have to stay behind on lands. Um, so it's not a catch up mechanic, but it definitely is a mustard one. Okay. Next up we've got skull clamp. Woo! Ah, another classic one drop one mana artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus one minus one. Whenever equipped creature dies, draw two cards and it has equip one. Wow. So you put this on a one, one token. That's the easiest way that thing dies. You draw two cards instantly. Oh, so good. Amazing feeling Oof, man and you can do this i've done this again three four times in the turn you're drawing six eight ten cards because you have an army of one ones out there can really keep you in a game for sure yeah and you're okay you're okay tossing a one one white josh lee Kwai soldier token uh because getting two cards for that one one token that wasn't really doing much on the board is super duper worth it so this is a little situational requires you to have creatures that will hopefully die when the skull camp gets equipped to it uh, you don't want to play this in deck where you're hoping your creature dies from removal or board wipes. It just won't happen that often. Jimmy, but, here's the real question. Yeah. Did we cheat by including this because for just one mana, it does nothing and sits on the board. You have to also equip it. Oh, it does so have a tiny bit. So is this a two bit. mana spell? Did Ooh, we just cheat? Ooh, it's interesting. I would say that similar to like Mystic Remora where you're paying a cumulative upkeep, you are expected to pay a little bit more over time. Mm. Uh, and But you, I will agree though that yeah, it does require a teeny bit of setup. You need those creatures and it can't just function by itself like the Remora or the Esper Sentinel or the Langtax does. It's so good though. But it is so, so <laughs> very good yeah so good. i think because of the efficiency of the equip cost and just how many cards you're drawing for one mana it, it i think you, you can definitely include it on this list it might draw the most cards like when it's when it's going it might draw the most cards of all the ones that we mentioned so far yeah oh for sure but requires that deck again that has exactly. those creatures so our pick for best one drop card draw this one's tough i think it's a tie between the first two of mystic remora and esper sentinel i do you know what i think i'm gonna go with skull clamp oh Nice. I think that you're right. I think Mystic Remora is the most powerful one, but I'm personally going to pick Skull Clamp because I feel like it will give you the cards when you need it. Because when I uh, when I use Skull Clamp, like I go off and I'm you're like, searching, you're equip, digging. equip, equip. And it's like you draw, 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 draw. You find what you need, you refill. Whereas Mystic Remora, I have to rely on you, on everyone else to be able to play things. Right. So I don't always get the cards when I need it, when I have the mana, when I want to do something. Yep, I agree there. And it, there is also a thing to be said that it can be played in any deck. And that, you know, blue has a lot of card draw already. So as Mystic Remora's value go down just a little bit because other sources of that exist. I mean, clearly Esper Sentinels goes up uh, because it's white, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. All right. That's a great, uh, great little discussion there. All right. Let's move on now to tutors. This is one of the most powerful ways and efficient ways to increase the power level of your deck because it just says each of the tutors says, hey, I'm another copy of another card in your deck that you may need when the situation arises. So you get redundancy and access to those powerful cards, answers, combo pieces, what have you. So first up, we have five tutors. These are all of the classic tutors, and there's actually one in each color. Would you Mm -hmm. believe it? So white's got enlightened tutor, blue has mystical tutor, black has vampiric tutor, red has gamble, and green has worldly tutor. Why Why doesn't red have one that has tutor in the name? I know, right? So sad. All right, so Enlightened Tutor, Artifact or Enchantment to the top of your library at instant speed. Mystical Tutor, Instant or Sorcery to the top of your library at instant speed. Vampiric Tutor, any card to the top of your library and you lose two life. Gamble, any card to hand, but then you have to discard a card randomly. And Worldly Tutor is a creature to the top of your library. I think one thing to point out with these is that this is not card advantage because it goes on the top of your library uh, yeah. or in Gamble's case, you're discarding a card. You're spending a card and not getting one back. And exactly. Yeah. Not getting one back. And so you that is a definite cost. But finding the exact right card might be worth throwing away a card. Yeah. 
Uh, so of these, I think we can both agree that the most powerful is vampiric tutor, tutor. Yeah. any card to the top of your library two life who cares about two life who cares about two life yeah <laughs> uh, i think that gamble by the way is definitely underplayed i think a lot of people are afraid of that random discard yeah but you know what embrace the chaos embrace the randomness you could have one of the most powerful tutors out there if you're lucky <laughs> yeah i think I'm, I'm worried about it because in mono red i'm dumping my hand and by the end of it i'm like draw gamble on turn seven and you're like i have two cards in my hand with gamble you gotta shoot it off you gotta you shoot do it, it off and do a 50 50 split but in early turns when you have a full grip gamble is really great yeah. um i do like it quite a bit i do agree that's underplayed but vampiric just has to be the, oh, best it's the power the power level of that is just crazy yeah and sure. there's again so many ways to draw that card off the top of your library so it's not stuck there or you do it on an end step and you draw that card for your turn so out of all all those definitely vampiric tutor um but a lot to be said about the rest of them blue gets incinerator sorceries blue loves that white gets artifact or enchantments smothering tithe and green gets a creature they love that as well yep okay so here's some other though one drop tutors that are a little more specific in their use and uh still very very powerful so first up is demonic consultation so this is a cedh staple you're doing this to get thassa's oracle out and win the game but we're not going to talk about the text on this. It's really complicated. You exile the top six cards of your library, you name a card, and then you go through until you find that card. Uh, so people just say a card that doesn't exist in their library, and they go through the whole deck. But you could use this as a regular tutor, right, DJ? You can. And I think that it's underused as a regular tutor, but people are, are afraid because right. this could be have a huge impact of your game. What if you name the card that you need, and it's the last <laughs> card in your deck? And then you're like, oh, ho, my library. Or it's in the top six. You and it exile gets those, and, and then there goes your whole library. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the thing. Gamble, the downside is you discard the card that you got, and you're like, I feel silly. At least it's in my graveyard. Demonic yeah. Consultation is like, oh, well, I've destroyed my game of Commander. Yeah, I, I so instantly lose a the little next bit time steep. I draw a card. <laughs> it's, a little bit, it's a little bit of a steep cost. Yeah, but the combo potential is there. I mean, if you need to find the exact card, you know you're going to win that turn with that card, then I think it's a pretty good bet to do something like that. Do you know Tutor I love is Crop Rotation. Ah, yeah. A single green for an instant. As an additional cost to cast this spell, Sacrifice a Land, Land, search your library for a land card and put that card onto the battlefield and shuffle your library. Wow, any land card, not any a basic. Land. Okay, so you there are some powerful land. lands. Think of like Gaius Cradle. Think yeah. of Glacial Chasm. Think of uh, Bajuka Bog. What if you're going off and I'm like uh, crop rotation bog you? Wow, it's out of so nowhere, great. one. Yeah, right. They're going through the graveyard. What option do you have if you ever Deathrite Shaman out? You can get rid of one card. That's not gonna be enough. But crop rotation can really get someone out of nowhere as an instant. Mm -hmm. um, that's, it's only limited like, by like the that. cool lands that you have. Honestly, like yeah. if you have enough utility in your mana base, then you can get exactly what you need on the battlefield. If you're playing expedition map in your uh, deck, then crop rotation, if it can fit in there, also seems like a really valid choice. Because again, you get that Urborg, you get whatever it is you need to finish that combo and go off. Expedition map, also one drop, but requires two to activate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and finally, we've got Entomb, one black mana for an instant. Search your library for a card, put that card into your graveyard, then shuffle your library. Why on earth would you just want a card directly into your graveyard? It's, Seems inefficient. Yeah, but it's basically a tutor. In fact, if your deck is built around it, this is stronger than Vampiric so Tutor. Could right? be amazing. Getting exactly what you need in your graveyard so that your deck can synergize with it and go off is just fantastic. Yeah, and there's a lot of use cases. Either the card you put into your graveyard has a flashback cost or something on it, or you have a card in your hand that allows you to bring that card back onto the battlefield or back into your hand. So it's basically, right, it can, there's a lot of different use cases for Entomb. Entomb is so good, by the way. Gamble could just be another copy of Entomb if you're lucky enough. See? <laughs> Gamble's just all of these cards if you're lucky enough. Yeah, that's a really good point. Good job, Gamble. Well, Crop Rotation puts the land on the battlefield, so that is a uh, lot That different. is pretty good. Yeah, you're right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Demonic Consultation, uh, I saw this thread that Gavin put online, which is like, if you're not naming thought, you know, what are you naming to get to exiling your whole library because you're trying to name a card outside of the game? Charging Badger? Charging Badger. <laughs> Someone said, you are already dead. Oh, that's a good was one. a too. really good one to name. Yeah, because it's like the game is over. Uh, so yeah, lots of good instances, uh, things to grab there. Okay, so what's our vote for best one-drop tutor that's not from the first five here, from these okay. three? Uh, I'm going to go with Crop Rotation. I'm going to go with the Tomb. I think both of them are actually really, really close in terms of power level, um, but 
In two, I see a lot of graveyard decks these days. I think it's pretty powerful. I mean, we talk about how important it is to interact with the graveyard. Like, Entomb is just another piece of the puzzle that says, oh, yes, you definitely need to answer these really critical threats. Yeah, but I love the idea of crop rotation for a bazooka bob to answer your Entomb. So maybe you have the one up in the rock, paper, scissors battle here, DJ. <laughs> All right, we got a bunch more categories to go into. Uh, we got recursion, reuse, combo, sack outlets, damage, haste, interaction, and counter spells. Oof. But before we get to it, we're gonna take a short break and hear from our mid-roll sponsors. Now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. All right, since Audric Master Tactician is attacking, I get to choose how you block. So let's maybe put that there and you could double block there. Oh, I'm sorry, my brain is struggling. <clears throat> if I may, let me give you a Master Tactician's advice. Yes, please. Battles aren't won on the field. They're won in the mind. And if you want the strategic advantage of a toned and trained thought sponge, I recommend BetterHelp Online Therapy. Puzzles and brain teasers are great intellectual exercises, but the emotional side is just as important, soldier. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video phone and even live chat-only sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Hey, thanks for the advice. Now, what about this combat? No blocks, man. He's dead on board. All right. <laughs> Duh. Stupid talking card. Command Zone listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Command Zone. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Command Zone. Hey, it's me, Will the Wise, and... Yeah! Uh, sorry, just another horrible vision from a spooky universe beyond. Look, I hate the Upside Down, but the strange thing is, I love the Upside App. You see, while the Upside Down is full of monsters, the Upside app is full of savings. These days, shelling out for gas hurts more than getting chomped by the Demogorgon. But with Upside, you get cash back every time you pay at the pump, buy groceries, or go to a restaurant. I saw a sweet offer at the gang's favorite pizza joint, so I claimed it, checked in, and got paid just for treating my friends. Now I can afford a new dice set. To get started, download the free Upside app in the App Store or Google Play, then use promo code COMMANDS and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Plus, my investigations show you'll get three times more money than you would from overcomplicated loyalty programs. So trust me, Upside really is the wise choice. And that's coming from me, Will the Guy. Will the Wise. Download the free Upside app and use promo code COMMAND to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using promo code COMMAND. Greetings, traveler. I am Tivit, seller of secrets. Welcome to my seller of secrets. Now, it's no secret that I deal in information, but I am small, sphinxy potatoes compared to colossal tech companies. How can anyone defend themselves against such behemoths? A conundrum. But I will slip you this secret on the house. For less than $7 per month, you can join me and fight back against big tech by using ExpressVPN. Here's a riddle. How does Twitter make money? By tracking your searches, your history, your every click, then selling all those sumptuous personal secrets. But with ExpressVPN, your very identity is a secret. They cloak your IP address, so you appear as anonymous, as a legitimate business person. That's why I use ExpressVPN on every device, so no one may exploit my delicious data for profit except me. And if you are wise, you shall do the same. When it comes to protecting yourself online, ExpressVPN gets my vote. Twice. If you don't like big tech tracking you and selling your personal data for profit, it's time to fight back. Visit expressvpn.com slash command right now to get three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn.com slash command. Again, expressvpn.com slash command. All right, we're back talking about the best one drop cards in commander one drops means one mana value one cmc however you want to cut it it is the same result it just costs one man to play we just talked about entomb and entomb goes really well with this next category it's recursion slash reuse so That's right these cards can really surprise a player because it can just get a big value out of nowhere it's like mm -hmm. oh that thing's dead or that thing's in your graveyard no it's not surprise it's back again surprise i brought it back through the breach i reanimated it oh that's our transition. first uh that's our first card here uh, this is one of the most powerful reanimation effects ever printed it's black sorcery put target creature card from a graveyard by the way onto the battlefield under your control you lose life equal to the mana value Ooh. Okay, wow. so 
reanimation spells are the best when they cheat the most mana, mm -hmm. you know? And so reanimate being one mana means that you can get a big old eight drop and cheat seven mana and get it out super early in the game. Yeah, as early as turn two, turn I one know. even. Yes. Yeah. And so if you if you have like a five mana reanimation effect, that still can be great. It still can cheat mana, you know, but you, when you get it out on turn five and you cheat three mana to get out that eight drop, how much are you really cheating your opponents? Yeah, at that point, someone may have actually caught up to you because they've yeah. ramped a few times. They have something else that does a similar effect. So being able to reanimate something that is so powerful because, again, it could be something in your graveyard, my graveyard, and you could entomb it in there very early on and just go nuts. That early, that cheaply means that this power level is just out of control. Yeah, so reanimate, one of the most powerful cards ever printed. We have 40 life in Commander as well, so you're not too worried about that life loss. Mm -hmm. There is the downside. Sometimes you draw this late and you cannot pay the life, and so it comes kind of dead. But I would say all the other use cases before then, pretty good. For sure. Uh, this next one's a lot of uh, really interesting. There are a lot of more effects like this that are printed recently, but this is one of the only ones. In fact, this may be the only one that's just one mana. It's Malakir Rebirth. So this is MDFC. There's a land on the other side that enters the battlefield tapped. Uh, but it's an instant. Choose target creature. You lose two life. Well, the, at, well, 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 until end of turn, that creature gains. When this creature dies, return to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control. So the reuse effect here is nice. Someone hmm. kills your thing, you get it back, but it comes in tapped. Or you do something like cast this on your gray merchant, sacrifice it, returns again, and you oh. drain them again. Oh. You know, or you, Gross. I mean, I mean, classic stuff is like you evoke your shriek mall or your solitude or, you yeah. know, your, your grief. And then before In that response. trigger resolves, yeah. exactly, you cast the Malachi rebirth and then suddenly it's not going to the graveyard. It's back again for its ETB trigger. Yeah, I like that a lot. Malachi rebirth. And these effects are pretty gotcha effects. They come out of nowhere. People don't expect them generally. And you can double up on the enter the battlefield ability. I also like that this, again, it's very situational, but it only costs one mana. So if you have a solid board and people are looking to board wipe, it's easy to keep up one mana and then keep your best creature around so that you can keep the pressure on your opponents. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, yeah, so I expect to see more of these effects getting printed and played hopefully over the next few years. I really like them. I think it's like got that great sort of Timmy vibe to it where it's like, ha ha, gotcha. My Terastodon is back. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, Terastodon. Yeah, it's pretty nice one. Also uh, pretty good with reanimate, so. <laughs> also really good with the fact that it's just a land if you need it. Yeah. Right? The backside's yeah. a land. It doesn't replace uh, when your card's in the deck. It could just replace one of your lands. So this is almost like a quote-unquote free spell. It's free real estate to put in your deck. Mm -hmm. uh, last option here, though. I like this one a lot. This may be my favorite. What do you think? Uh, it's amazing. It's Ephemerate. Ephemerate is a single white mana for an instant exile target creature you control, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control, and it has rebound. So ah. you're going to get to do this again. Yeah, so you exile it as it resolves. At the beginning of your next upkeep, you can cast it from exile without paying its mana cost. Now, it's just one mana, so it's not a big deal, but you get to flicker two things twice. So this, or one thing twice. <laughs> this gives you your protection. So if someone goes to, you know, single target removal, your thing, you're like, just kidding. No. Uh, but more importantly, I think it just synergizes with enter the battlefield effects because it's that you get it twice thing that makes it really powerful. Yeah. And you don't have to target the same creature both times. Either you could go for something else. Uh, I like Ephemerate a lot. Flickering is one of my favorite things to do in the world. This doesn't save it from a board wipe because it will return to the battlefield immediately and then see the board wipe again. But you wrote this really interesting combo here, which is if you play a spell seeker, that's going to find you the ephemerate. Then you can cast the ephemerate on the spell seeker, get another spell, and then you can cast it again on the spell seeker and get another spell. So ephemerate and spell seeker turns into like fetch like build two. Build your own incestor rig, not quite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, very it's, it's slowly. really good. Yeah. And there's so many good ETB cards out there that that do so much. You know, in a deck with Panharmonicon and Brago or whatever, you're going to have ephemerate as one of probably your biggest, all highest performing all-stars in that deck. Also works with those evoke shenanigans, same as Malakir Rebirth. Like if you evoke your solitude, oh, right. you can ephemerate it with the trigger on the stack. It comes back again and doesn't go away anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our pick for best one drop uh, in the recursion slash reuse category. The most powerful is reanimate. Definitely. 
any graveyard could get you a massive game ending threat, a combo piece out of the graveyard instantly. Not to mention your opponent's graveyards too. It's like, it's so good. But can I pick Malakir Rebirth? Cause I like that one more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's got a lot of flexibility. It can be a land in your deck. I like that it's a land. None of these other cards can be a land. Jeez, talk yeah. about talk about overachieving there. Um, I, I personally just love Ephemerate. It's one of those cards that I love to play in the deck. I love saving my stuff. Uh, and of course, getting those enter the battlefield abilities is always nice. Okay, let's talk now about c -c 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 combo. The best one drops to get your combo going. Now, we didn't go super wild on this category because combos by nature are very narrow. Yeah. You know, you need to have a specific deck or specific type of cards. Um, but there are a few of them that I think are good more universally. Yeah, so this first one is one that keeps going up in value for me. It's Training Grounds. Uh, by the way, there's a Judge promo for this that came out recently. It's like Judge oh. Academy. It's, it's themed from Kamigawa. It's got two people with katanas fighting. One person's doing like a backflip. And it's really cool. I don't cool. think I've seen that before. Yeah, it just came out June, I think. So I, I was looking up card images for this and I was like, oh my gosh, didn't even know this existed. Training Grounds, uh, originally though, was a Zendikar card. It was one blue for an enchantment. It activated abilities of creature you control, cost up to two mana less to activate. And this effect can't reduce the amount of mana and ability cost to activate to less than one mana. Oh my gosh. So just making everything cheaper is incredibly powerful. Like when you have an activated ability, it's priced to be balanced. Yes. And when you reduce that cost by two, then it becomes imbalanced. Like it just becomes broken. Yeah. I think the classic is uh, Thrasios Triton Hero. You've seen Josh Rukai combo off with this a couple of times. Yeah, yeah it's very I have powerful. Uh, that's a green and a blue for a one, three Merfolk wizard. You can pay four mana to scry one, then reveal the top card of your library. If it's land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, otherwise draw a card. Now at four mana, I've still seen people go off with this card. Yeah. But just imagine this ability at two mana. Yeah, that's would coiling oracle. Would you do anything <laughs> else than just activate it over and over again? Nope. Just activate, 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 activate. You just sit there, pump two mana in, oh my ramp, gosh or get a card ramp or get a card ramp or get a card you're digging through your deck you're finding your win cons you're getting the mana out to do it even more the next turn thrasios is one of those cards that just has it all on one card and training grounds is insane with it and this is just one of them training grounds is going to have infinite like possibilities and wizards is going to keep printing cards with activated abilities yep. and so training grounds is going to maintain its awesome combo potential in the future yeah and that's a reason why i like it so much right you're looking into the future when i try and speculate on things i'm like you know what is this card going to be doing anything in two years and it's like yeah i can see a lot more of this effect going it's not like energy or a, a, you know <laughs> something that is never going to come back or mutate right it doesn't have as much future use as a card like training grounds you're gonna have to wait a long time for the the next mutate set yeah or the next energy set yeah. um but there's another card that actually fits into that same category and it's one of my favorite cards which is it's only going to get better over time it's amulet of vigor one mana for an artifact whenever a permanent enters the battlefield tapped and under your control untap it any permanent and cards again are balanced to come into the battlefield tapped mm -hmm. because that makes them less broken or whatever it is like a like even like bounce lands right and this is the classic combo in the sort of amulet titan deck in modern bounce lands come in as tapped they bounce a land in your hand if they come in untapped you're getting two mana off that land the same turn that comes in and not to mention amulet of vigor affects any permanence so there are so many permanents across the history of magic that will like this card i would say even in a budget deck and you're playing gates life lands mm. all shock lands all those things amulet of vigor does so much work because even those lands are coming in untapped so I like this card a lot. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's definitely a good one for sure. All right, we only had two cards in this category for combo. Yeah, there's so many. Of Training them. Grounds or Amulet of Vigor. Uh, I'm going to go for Amulet of Vigor. I'm going to go for Training Grounds because even though uh, Thrath Thrasios is not exactly what I want to do, <laughs> uh, there's some janky cool things out there that go crazy with Training Grounds. So I'm going to pick that one. Very much. Okay. Next up, Sacrifice Outlets. And there aren't too many choices here because a lot of sack outlets are three mana, four mana, whatever. Or they require a bunch of extra costs mm -hmm. to like tap them, the card. Like Vampiric Rites is a activated, you know, you have to pay two, two in order to sacrifice it. Yeah, and two life, I think. Yeah. Um, but they're uh, very, very powerful, very common in Commander now. And they're great because, again, they can protect against things like someone stealing your creature or you get a little extra value if someone board wipes. Um, so, so I'm like, I understand that there could be, you know, specific damage decks, aristocrats decks, or mm -hmm. maybe I'm creating some sort of combo loop or something like that is, and I know that these sacrifice outlets are going to be great in those decks. Just, but what about just a normal deck? 
Just an average deck, Jimmy. It's tough. I think it's really hard to say, yeah, put put a altar in your deck unless you have a way to use it. You're going to make enough creatures to sacrifice to go into a combo or to play a spell that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. So they're a little narrow, but these two that we picked, actually, I think you could arguably put at least one of them in any deck that plays the color. All right, let's see them. The first one that is viscera seer or as we used to pronounce it five years ago viscera seer very incorrect it's one black for a creature uh one one you can sacrifice a creature to scry one all right scry one scry one you scry one a couple times and that's uh, that selection feels like it feels like it generates you a card yeah because you could scry two things you don't want to the bottom of your library instead of wasting two turns or two card draws drawing those uh and notably it can sacrifice itself so i've seen some people board wipe or i've done this myself right past turn it's the last turn i think i'm gonna be alive okay viscerous here you're gonna do some work sacrifice a bunch of things mm-hmm. and itself to maybe draw through five different cards not draw put five cards on the bomb to try and get to that answer um so it has a lot of use there that is powerful in the late game when you need the right card viscerous here can get you there yeah the um, next the next one is carrion feeder a single black mana for a one one zombie carrion feeder can't block sacrifice a creature put a plus one plus one counter on carrion feeder okay so this is much more simple it's a beat stick it gets really big and strong if you have a creature a uh, bunch of creatures sacrificed to it and again it can sacrifice itself but you don't get scry one off it yeah scry one's definitely better in a game where we care much more about uh finding the right card as we are with uh getting carrion feeder bigger yeah. i think that the biggest thing is that there's no cost just free free sacrifice yeah that's the big one and you get a value thing out of it now carrying feeder in the right deck give it unblockable in fact could kill someone but it can't block but viscerous here who yeah. viscerous th- here is my pick oh for sure my pick as well and i you know i went through all the other one drop things that say sacrifice on it and they are they have either too many other costs or whatever mm-hmm. so i really do like viscerous here as the uh, all-star here okay that's good Next, let's toss, talk about some damage. Damage. You know, one one mana doesn't really get us that much damage. Like, if we think about the classic lightning bolt, one mana in a card gets us three damage. Okay. That's fine, but yeah. lightning bolt did not make our list of damage dealing one drops. No. No, that's just not powerful enough in Commander. Yeah, we, we want, need we more want damage. Big damage, yeah. Uh, and so we've got three cards here. They're both, they're all pretty good. The first up is Berserk. It's one green man for an instant. You can cast it only before the combat damage step. Kind of weird timing. Uh, it's an old card. And it says target creature gains trample and gets plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is its power. At the beginning of the next end step, destroy that creature if it attacked this turn. Whoa, Whoa. big damage. So yeah, so it, creature needs to be attacking, uh, typically, uh, for it to be destroyed. And it can only happen before the combat damage step, but it's kind of like Xenagos a little bit, but it gives it trample, which is pretty yeah. good. So you could use this on the opponent's creature to destroy someone else, and then at end step, the creature dies because of Berserk's effect. Oh, that's a nice two for one. Hey, Craig, with that infect creature, here you go. You can have infect while you're attacking yeah, Josh. Yeah, he's like smiling and crying at the same and time. Then, and then your creature also dies, sorry. Yeah. It's, yeah, so it's a funny removal spell. It's a bit uh, narrow, but this could potentially add, you know, plus 12 plus zero or whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, green creatures can get big, and so making them even bigger to take someone out, that that's generating a lot of damage for sure. Yeah, yeah, and it could swing a combat in your favor. It could swing a combat against, like two people going against each other. Oh, you know, we really have to get rid of that Eldrazi. Yeah, let's swing in. I'm going to berserk it, make it do 22 trample damage, and then sacrifice it. And the other, right, that's a huge swing, and you just played one green man to do so. A lot of damage. I like that. All right, next up, we have a favorite of mine. It's Rites of Initiation. Never seen this card before, by the way. A single red mana for an instant. Discard any number of cards at random from your hand. Creatures you control get plus one plus oh until end of turn for each card discarded this way. Wow. Okay. So you're, it's a go wide strategy, right? Absolutely. So you have like, you have a board mm-hmm. and you're swinging in, you know, and what do you do? People say no blocks. I'm going to, you know, I'll let your seven one, one ones. ones get through. No prob. One red mana chucking your hand. <laughs> And this five is cards. game. This is game ending, right? Yeah, if you give them all plus five plus oh, those seven creatures are thirty five damage. That's right insane. There. Yeah, that is really insane. Now you do lose your entire dang hand to do so. You could get lucky and <laughs> just discard at random all but one card and keep the one card you really want. Yeah, there you go. And it's gamble. Uh, 
Yeah, well, there's also, again... It's big cost. It's for sure a big cost. A big cost. I would say in a card like Reality Everwise or decks that want you to discard cards, very good. Uh, but otherwise, you're looking for a token deck. You're looking for this to be a big finisher. And maybe this does need to pair up with a bunch of card draws so you can discard four cards and still have you know three or four in your hand. I, like I, think, that that, I think that for a single mana, this might produce... Uh, just the most damage. Yeah, you right. Know what it's, I mean? it's better like, than my Berserk case with an Eldrazi. I just t- we just talked about the case where seven like creatures. twelve or whatever like that damage. Yeah, yeah. But now you're you doing know. thirty-five with seven creatures. So. Yeah, we're talking about game-ending damage on, on the other side. So definitely very cool. Yeah, I like that. Okay, uh, this next one I did not think about it, uh, but this is actually I love it. Now that now that I know you've got some stories about it too. It's Blood Chief Ascension. I'll read it and you can talk about it. Black for an enchantment at the beginning of each end step. If an opponent lost two or more life this turn, you may put a quest counter on blood chief ascension and whenever a card is put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere if blood chief ascension has three or more quest counters on it you may have that player lose two life if you do you gain two life okay so a single black mana this doesn't immediately come online someone everyone has to you have to lose two in your end step but this is a four player game you know we're gonna there only needs to be three quest counters on it like people are gonna lose two life yeah but by their end step yeah by yeah, their yeah. end step like sometimes you just lose two life when you shock a shock lane oh play. that's right yeah or even play a fetch and cruise bullet and play a fetch again yeah, like or, there's yeah. just lots of ways for this to be online i've never had a problem with this becoming online yeah. okay so it's gonna come online very quickly uh and then it's just this thing that sits on the battlefield and suddenly people are like oh a board wipe right now. Oh no. A board wipe that takes out five or six creatures. Those are sending things to the graveyard. Five or six times. That's 10 or 12 life they lose and you gain that much life. Yes. Or it's just going to the graveyard. What about discard? What about mill? What about about a wheel effect? What about playing any spell? I know it's insane. The amount of damage that this thing can deal is just crazy. And especially in the late game when people have big boards where people are discarding their hands and refilling them where people are doing big things. Wow. Wow. Yeah. A card is put into the opponent's graveyard from anywhere. Milling, from all anywhere. that stuff. Yeah. It's got that Sir Conrad type effect. Kemble, uh, the console, of, uh, whatever that guy does a lot of work by draining constantly. Yeah. You, you're noticing that just a couple drains actually put in a big uh, impact on the game where, you know, that life gain starts adding up. Yeah. And this is an even bigger effect. Yeah. If everyone even tries to target you and go after you, maybe you've gained 36 life or whatever by this point and you're pretty untouchable. You can board wipe too. Oh, yeah. You could just be like, all right, I'm going to, yeah, this is this is getting out of control. Board wipe, drain everyone. You okay, know? yeah. I'm yeah, going to yeah. wield, you know, suddenly everyone's getting drained for that as well. Okay. All right. I love this. All right, we got three choices here for damage, Berserk, Rites of Initiation, or Blood Chief Ascension. I'm pretty sure we all know what your pick, DJ, is. Yeah, mine is Blood Chief Ascension. Okay. I've put this in a lot of different decks, and I've seen it do a lot of work. It's a staple of mine. I'm going to do that, too. It's... I'm going to put this in more decks. <laughs> I really want to see this go off now because one of my... It's not hard. It's like it yeah. really does just go off. One of my big problems in Commander is I go really low on life really quickly and I don't have a way of gaining it back and I don't want to put in cards that are dedicated to just doing that. Yeah. So Blood Chief Ascension has a great aristocracy effect to it. You're that, playing Bolus of Citadel, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you need some life gain. I definitely need some life There you gain. go. All right. Okay, next up we have Haste. So haste, there's a lot of uh, different ways to describe haste. There's haste on enchantments that grant haste. Uh, there's haste that gives your creatures haste. And then there's just haste on creatures as well. So we're first going to talk about haste for everyone. Uh, this is a very dangerous type of effect. I've lost because I've played these cards before. Typically, you want to play this card on the turn you're going to win because it's so cheap and efficient. It's a one drop. And then it gives all your creatures haste. So... Mass Hysteria and Concordant Crossroads both say the same thing for one red or one green. All creatures have haste. What do you think about these cards, DJ? So you wouldn't play them on turn one. Just turn one for this card. Yeah, never, I wouldn't ever, ever. I think that it is critical in certain decks. Uh, and I oftentimes will play Concordant Crossroads as sort of like a combo finisher. Like if I'm in a big mana deck mm-hmm. and I am a you know green side or a Genesis Waving. You know what I mean? Like if I'm Genesis waving for a huge amount, I'm hoping that Concordant Crossroads is in that huge amount of stuff that will then let all my creatures attack. Yeah, or you save one mana because it's in your hand. You you Genesis Mm -hmm. wave for everything but one land 
and then you tap that to play concurrent crossroads. Oh, no, I'm hoping I get a land in that Genesis Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, to no, play it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also, it's like, okay, I need to you have activated abilities, too. You know, uh, I have a combo, yeah. oh, I have activated right. abilities. You know, I'm going to play it, boom, play the concordant crossroads, then I can go off. And so this really is sort of uh, another piece of a larger combo rather than just, uh, oh, I want everyone to attack a lot. What if you're playing an elf ball deck and you've got all those elves that need to tap yeah. for mana or to give your team boosted up. Would you then think about concurrent crossroads very early on? Because let's say you concurrent crossroads on two, you play an elf, tap it. Yeah, play an elf, next turn, it, next turn I next play my turn, right? arch druid or my, you know, yeah. By turn three or four, your opponents, they're not going to have game winning positions because of that haste. Maybe they're getting a little advantage, but you're really taking advantage of it. I would, I wouldn't, be trusting the top of my deck to give me what I needed. I, it would need to be in my hand. In your right? hand. Yeah. Or tutors or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a deck where mass hysteria on one just suddenly does, you know, make your deck really aggressive and sort of curve out and you're using it way more than your opponents are. Cranko is the, uh, Ooh, thing I can really that think might about. Be a good one. Yeah. yeah. Or even the, uh, the goad. Um, there's another goad Grenzo, that mm. one where you, uh, yeah. Uh, so I think there are some cases, but red has a lot of help here already. We can discard Anger to the Graveyard or play cards like Fervor yeah. or Abrask. And so I think Mass Hysteria is a little worse in the red version because green doesn't have Haste Granters in the same way that red does. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, and then uh, now let's talk about Haste on the Creature. Okay. So obviously Haste is very important, very powerful. Josh talked about it being as one of those more underrated mechanics. Um Maybe the best one drop ever printed has haste on it. It's Ragavan Nimble Pilferer. Man, I don't even want to read all the text. On well, hang on, hang on. Is this cheating as well? Because it has haste when you dash it. Yeah, that's a good point. That that's you dash point. it for two mana. For not two one. mana, yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe this can't count as a as a haste one drop. But maybe this the, should be a, maybe this should be a rampy one drop in the ramp category. <laughs> that's right. Because right. when it, when it connects, you get a you get a, a treasure. treasure token, which yeah. is insane. Yeah. Or Rag they, uh, put it in the card draw category. You get to steal cards when it connects. Rag Look, this is why Ragavan is... It Rag belongs Man in is... too many categories, Yeah, this card. too insane of a creature card. Um, so maybe we'll just skip it, you know? Ragavan doesn't deserve a spot <laughs> here. Instead, we have cards like Legion Loyalist, which I really like. It's a red man with yeah. haste. When it attacks and you attack with at least two other creatures... Uh, Creatures you control gain first strike and trample and can't be blocked by creature tokens. So this is just like a one mana on a stick, play it, win the game kind of card, even more so than Mass Hysteria in the right deck. Uh, I've played this before. In, I have it in a goblin deck and I've attacked and my opponent has started setting up blocks. I'm like, oh no, it's it, your yeah, tokens can't block. can't block. And they're like, wait, what? It, That's all I wanted to block your one ones with. Like, it, not to mention right. like trample is crazy. It's this is really honestly uh, a pushed card. First, first strike trample too. Oh gosh. So I think in a creature based deck, Legion Loyalist is really important. Uh, there's also like Wayward Guide Beast. It's a one mana or trample haste two two. Uh, when it deals combat damage, you return a land you control to its owner's hand. So maybe there's something there for landfall decks, but nothing really compared to Legion Loyalist. I think. And then Ragavan is just gross. Yeah, we don't even want to read the text because it's <laughs> in too many categories. Um, okay, so best one drop for haste. I think it's Concordant Crossroads. Everything else so that too. we talked about was red, and we can see that there's it's a normal effect in red. Yeah. And so I want to go with the effect that doesn't normally have it, which is green. Yeah, and they just reprinted this in Double Masters too, so I would love to see... I, it's one of my favorite cards, Concordant Crossroads. I would love to see more of these on the table because when it lands, I'm like, whoo, we are in for it now. <laughs> and if the person passes turn, then it's like, oh, we are really in for it now because oh, everyone one's going to get access to this effect. Okay. All right. Well, we saved some of the best for last. Uh, we have interaction as one of our big categories here. So many one mana ways to remove stuff and, and, and target stuff. Huh? Absolutely. A lot of these are going to be very uh, familiar to us. Swords to plowshares, one white mana instant, exile target creature, it's controller gains life equal to its power. Similarly, we have path to exile, one white mana, uh, instant exile target creature, it's controller uh, may search their land library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield tapped and shuffle their library. And then you have Rapid Hybridization and Pongify, both blue instants of the story creature. Then they get a 3-3 of some type, either a monkey or a lizard. <laughs> uh, green doesn't get that uh, single target creature removal. It does have uh, Nature's Claim for a single green mana in an instant. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. Its controller gains three life. Pretty good. And then black has Defile, which is instant target creature gets minus one, minus one till end of turn for each swamp you control. So some Tragic Slip vibes there. Yeah. Tragic I I didn't include Tragic Slip 
ship or fatal push because I feel like the real modes you need something else going on. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. And there's, it's not like we're searching for it too. There's so many cards that are just Absolutely. on their face. Do it. Um, and then you've got red elemental blast and pyro blast, which also function as counter spells, but it's specific hate because it destroys target permanents that are blue. So. I think that a lot of this interaction is pretty normal where people are like, yep, one man interaction, solid. I know about this. I'm going to play it. Yeah. I think that the interesting ones are what we've chosen for red. You know, we yeah. chose red elemental blast and pyroblast. Both anti blue cards specifically can't be played outside of that vacuum, can sometimes just be completely dead in your hand. Also, can be the way that a mono red deck actually hangs out and wins the game. <laughs> Many times I've seen mono red decks win because of these cards. Uh, did they just need that answer? And again, like, do you, do you need to be, can you put this in just a generic deck with not knowing your play group and just hope that there's blue at the table? Yeah, probably. I think so too. But I would say the generic deck needs to, again, not have blue in it because you would just play a counterspell or whatever in that case, mm, right? Yeah. Uh, if you have your like black, black, red. Or, bl or red, white or something red, like that. Red, white, yeah. Then I can see these actually having a lot of effect. But I wouldn't play both. I'd probably just play one. Mm. Unless you know you're running with a lot of blue decks around the table. I might play both. I've seen this. I've had this be too good too often. Uh, and I've lost to Cyclonic Rift too many times that good point. I'm going to, I'm going to just see this as the price of what I need to do. I need to play these cards and I need to blow out the blue player. Okay. So this is a tough one. Best pick or our pick for best one drop interaction. So many good options here. I'm going to go with the, the pyroblast pyroblast really for the, for the best. I, I wow. destroy any blue permanent and counter. Yeah. It's like, so it's modal. Yes. It does the most powerful, biggest things. Now it's not as, uh, Interaction is best when it can hit the most things, mm -hmm. you know, and you're right. This can only hit blue things. Yeah. You know, so it is, is pretty narrow, but for the most part, I'm not as worried about creatures. I don't know. Maybe I should be worried about creatures. <laughs> Everyone has a creature in their command zone. Huh? That's a good point. Yes. Yeah. So I would say swords is probably the one I would choose. I don't want to give my opponent a land necessarily with path. I think path is the worst. I think that giving them a land is a definite downside. Yeah, but it's still a very good card, right? We're talking relative terms here. I also swords really so like good. nature's claim a lot. Mm. I think just being able to take out, especially these days, right? Like you said, maybe we should be more afraid of artifacts and enchantments. As I think we should, for sure. Right? You get a great henge out on the table. That thing needs to get taken taken care of mm -hmm. uh, smothering tithe ristic study uh, and that to me is more worrying than a creature that i could potentially block i feel also that these enchantments or artifacts they sometimes uh, get their value pretty quickly and so even if you wait a whole turn and you finally play your creature with a destroy effect on it right you know uh then that doesn't actually get what you want done as well. You yeah, know? you want them to play the Ristic Study and before they even pass the turn, exactly. you, you cast Nature's that. Claim It. Yeah. And so that flexibility lets you do it. Like even if you evoke an Ingature for a single red mana, right. you know, it's still one mana and you're like, great, one mana, I answered it. Instant speed is right, kind of where you want to be. Yeah, I also like Defile a lot. Uh, it does require to have a lot of swamps in your deck, but it can get rid of indestructible creatures and can just be one of those ways where someone's like, oh, wow, I can't, I can't do anything to stop that from dying. I can't even, right, I can't make it indestructible or anything. It's just gone. I I like the way it kind of curves with the game too. A lot of times it's difficult for someone on turn three mm. to have an eight, eight on the battlefield. You know, a lot of times on turn three, they have a three drop. Right. And so defiles like naturally matches up with what's on the board. Yeah. And one more shout out just towards the plowshares. It gets yeah, it, cards like it's probably the best. You're right. Like steel Colossus. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Jimmy, it's the best. Okay. <laughs> Our last category here. And maybe the most contentious it's counter spells. Woo. We just talked about two of them, Red Elemental Blast and Pyroblast. Yep. And of course, the cheaper the Counterspell, the better. It allows the player to keep the mana open, and Counterspell is just going to be available in more situations. Now, these are slightly, uh, how do you say it? Slightly uh, uh, specific, and some of them have some downsides, but they're pretty good. The first one is Swan Song. Josh is quite favorite. Blue man for an instant. Counter target enchantment, instant, or sorcery spell. And its controller creates a 2-2 blue bird creature token with flying. Very good. 2-2 two, two bird token with flying is a very small downside. We're willing to give them 3-3 three, three frog lizards, right? Yep. So a 2-2 two, two swan is totally acceptable. Notably, though, this doesn't hit creatures. It does not hit artifacts. Doesn't I am hit worried about artifacts. I don't think I'm worried about creatures or planeswalkers as yeah. much, but I am definitely worried about artifacts. There are some very powerful artifacts out there. Uh, swan song, though, I've just seen it do a lot of work because sometimes someone dumps six mana into an enchantment 
and you really blow them out if you get rid of that because they're hoping that's like or it's a five mana Marari's wake mm -hmm. it's gonna set them up it's send a car resurgent whatever it is and you're like Meh, one mana see you later doubling season oh rough so I do like Swan Swan. So quite a bit. that enchantment mode is really like you're you're feeling like that's a good mode on the card. It's kind of why I gravitated towards Nature's Claim earlier as well. I think mm -hmm. I've just seen enchantments have more and more power as the game goes on and gets more cards for it. This next one's a brand new entry. I, I, this card, I'm still trying to figure out if I like it or not. Yeah, it's an offer you can't refuse. A single blue mana for an instant counter target non-creature spell. Its controller creates two treasure tokens. So this is non-creature. So this hits the planeswalkers and the artifacts that yep. we were kind of missing when it came to Swan Song. Uh, let's weigh two treasures versus a flying 2-2 two -two bird. 2-2 two -two bird sucks. So Well, it doesn't suck. I'll it's easily give that away. I'm not too worried about that. Two treasures. That's a soul ring. For one turn, <laughs> that is a two I do, mana I do think that's burst, a lot. That's right? a lot. That's a big burst. Yeah, yeah it, it takes him from. It's a dark ritual. Ah, yeah. yeah. It takes him from six to eight mana, right? It takes him from five to seven, and those jumps you can you can see the cards you can play at five. You can see the cards you can play at seven. You're like, oh my gosh, that's a lot. So it's a real trade off. Yeah, it is a real trade off, but you can counter any non-creature spell and you can hold it up. There's another similar card, Stubborn Denial, but it requires you to have creature, a uh, creature with power four or greater. Yeah, pretty limiting, yeah. But an offer you can't refuse just seems like it can get there and maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe you're on your game winning turn and you do that uh, and they, they, that was it. That was their answer and it doesn't matter. So Jimmy, we have the increased flexibility of being one mana mm -hmm. with all of these downsides versus something like a counter spell. Blue, blue, two mana. Which, it, what do you think is what do you think you would prefer to run? Probably Counterspell, but at the same time, blue, blue, if you're not, you know, again, that takes, you're very obvious you're holding it up. You're holding up one blue mana, it could be an opt, it could be a, a cantrip or something else, and, and a lot of times it is, but people I don't think see an offer you can't refuse coming. I think much. I like an offer you can't refuse better. I honestly do. Well, when you hold a blue, blue, everyone goes Counterspell, mana drain, whatever, I'm not gonna play into that. I think being two mana off of your curve to hold it up is a is more than twice as damaging. I oh, think just I see. being holding up counter spell means that you have oof, way fewer options of okay. using your mana when, during your turn, deploying things to the board. It's harder to hold up, and it's more than double as difficult to hold up as just a single mana. Wow, I actually like that a lot. So the idea again here, uh, listeners and viewers, is that if you hold up one mana and don't use it, not a big deal. Doesn't affect your curve too much. If you hold up two mana and don't use it, it's actually t more than twice as worse than holding up one mana. I think that it's a big, I think that it is a big cost being off by being off by two. And so to that degree, if you're holding up three mana, it's an even bigger cost. It's not yes. one mana times three. It's like almost like you're holding up four or five, right? It's, it feels even worse because you're really not playing cards. I think that, that past two, it's actually really difficult to, to, to hold it up. And so you need to have something else to do at instant speed or, or, like a your, or something. Yeah, or yeah. your counters need to be sort of modal, like an Archmage's charm where you're like, all right, I didn't hit anything. I'm going to, Cast and draw two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but just sitting with that mana up and doing nothing means that you are constantly being put behind in a game where everyone you're you're in a multiplayer game where everyone else is doing stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's a good point. For every one mana you don't spend, that's you know three turns that happen that you right. So that's really interesting. I like that actually a lot. And, and I, if I you're using that. them defensively too. Yeah. So that's just aggressively. That's where you're trying to answer the board. You feel like you're in a good spot and you're trying to mitigate what other people are doing. If you're right. using it defensively when you're going off you are going off one turn faster mm -hmm. with protection if you are, if your mana lines up to use a one mana counter spell versus a two mana counter spell. What if you have both Swan Song and an offer you can't refuse in your hand? That's just actually, that's even better, it's right? It's better than just having counter spell. It's way right? better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now obviously, counter spell counters any spell, and maybe you will have that sort of backup. Yeah, but if it's your turn and it's defensive, are you worried about a, I mean, technically. Yeah, you're like, not worried about the creature you're, flash. You're worried about much. way fewer things. Like you're just like the Venser gets me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And you can see that coming again because that's four man to hold yeah. to play that yeah i like that a lot that's a really interesting thing to think about we'd love to hear your opinions as well viewers and there's actually one more card in the one man counter spells we didn't mention it's fluster storm blue man for an instant counter target instant or sorcery spell unless his controller pays one but it has storm so it'll replicate itself for each other spell cast this turn i i think that this is not as powerful as the other two but 
it has so many cool and interesting synergies and stories behind it yeah. that it might be worth including just for that. Well, yeah, two I, opponents I, going off, right? They're, they're oh, casting so seven spells this turn, and at the end of it, you you're did, like... I've done that before. It's so great. Fluster Storm? <laughs> Replicate seven times? Can you pay seven mana for that last big thing? No. No, no, no. no. You, you just aim across the stack. Oh, you pick you yes. pick each so, one. Like, you guys are oh going after it. Like, you're going back and forth, and then at the end, like, there's this all this stuff going on. Why well, do this in response? And I do this in response. I do this in response. And then you're like, all right, before all this stuff happens... Fluster storm. I'm going to point two, two at here. that, one at that <laughs> part of the stack, one at this part of the stack, one at that part of the stack. And then we're going to let this one through to remove your creature. Yeah. And, and then the you're just like, and you're just like, all right, let's just resolve the stack. And then just everyone cries. cries. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. That is great. It's very, very narrow situation, but it's so awesome that I think that fluster storm is, uh, yeah. is definitely worth thinking well, about. Also, it's funny because fluster storm just by itself, sometimes we'll counter it just by itself. Cause spell pierce, oh, no, right? spell Cause it's always going to be two. Right? Yes. Because someone casts a spell, you cast Fluster Storm. That's two spells on the stack. You get two copies of Fluster Storm. So, yeah, it's Spell Pierce. Yeah. So, very, very powerful there. And uh, obviously, when um, things like Spell Pierce are played in CDH, less played, yeah. you know, in us, which is why it's not in this list specifically. Yeah. You know, but definitely a playable card. Okay. So, what's your pick for best one drop counter spell then? I'm going to go with an offer you can't refuse. Wow. I can't wait to see that played more. I think it is actually really close between Swan Song and Offer. And then Flusterstorm, like you said, can sometimes just come out up the back and be like, I'm here and I'm better than all of you. <laughs> I'm going to do everything on the battlefield. Okay. All right. Well, let's go back over the list now and take a look and let's pick our favorite overall one drop. It can be from any of these categories, ramp, mana, counter spells, uh, rituals, you know, resaving, reuse and all that stuff. Uh, As we know, it's impossible to pick the most powerful one because they're all, they're all, yeah, like there's objectively impossible. Yeah. It's so difficult. Um, I'm going to go with the one that I've used over and over again and I've seen do the most work and be the most splashy. Yeah. And that's Blood Chief Ascension. Okay. Great, it's very good. It's a favorite of mine and the amount of damage it can deal and the amount of pain it puts people through and on the gives battlefield. You life. Ugh. Uh, it's it's been spectacular for me. So okay. that's my go to card. I like it a lot. Now I could just sit here and name Vampiric Tutor, but that'll be boring. We're talking about favorite and it's gonna be my new favorite. It is Amulet of Vigor. Again. Yeah, nice. I love if I was to give a new player a deck and help them build it out and they had to not optimize mana based, I would include Amulet of Vigor in there. You just love those uh, bounce lands coming in untapped and just generating all that mana. Yeah, and there's only so creatures too and I've been it's so... It's like a ritual right there. Yeah, I've been yeah. also hosed by decks that are playing like creatures your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped like the, i that. think that that's an, in, an incredible like thing the the turtle that does it you yeah, know the new thalia the, thalia, the yeah. three mana thalia you know and i actually think that it really slows down the tempo and opens up lines of attack so i actually think that's very good yeah and again there's something like worn power stone as well enters the battlefield tapped there are a lot of cards out there that are trying to mitigate their power by entering the battlefield tapped amulet of vigor i think just has just a universal quality to it that will always apply uh, cool. and will play even more down the line okay to the listeners, what is your favorite three drop? Let us know in the comment if there's any three drops that we didn't talk about today that you want us to address. Ding! One drops. Tell us about your one drops. <laughs> you can tweet at us. You can send us a message on... Uh, I'm like, Jimmy, are you collecting uh, information for a future episode? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're just like mining the comments. Yeah, well, like, maybe the next one we can do is episode, two drops. Solved. <laughs> Yeah, we'll go into two drops and three drops and four drops. And eventually when we get to eight drops, we'll talk about three cards and that'll be the episode. It'll be very nice. Jimmy and I went through literally all of the one drops. There's thousands. And yeah. so there are ones that we eliminated that you might think are worth that people need to know about. So let us know down there in the comments. Yeah, it's a great chance too if you haven't used Scryfall to check it out and figure out what the command is to put in to search for just one drops and also to separate by just creatures or whatever. If you know that information, also post it in the comments. I'm sure someone will thank you for it. For sure. Okay. Well, we talked about a lot of cards today. Day, some that I know I need to pick up, you can do so at channelfireball.com slash command. They've got a great marketplace there. You're buying from le real local game stores across the country, sealed product, great prices, singles, uh, all sorts of different things. And also, like, you're just supporting a local game store. That's the best part about it for me. And you're also supporting our show. Now, that's the secondary part. But channelfireball.com slash command, that's our affiliate link. You can also just put in code command at checkout. And when you get those cards, throw them into an Ultra Pro sleeve, an Ultra Pro deck box, an Ultra Pro play mat. You can go to shop.ultrapro.com slash command. They've got all of the products there, uh, including stuff from the past and for, for stuff from other franchises and some great deals as well. Okay, cleanup step.
Big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. Damon Lynn, Sean the Gillis, Arthur Mello, Crawford, Ash- Ashlyn Rose, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Craig Blanchett, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Jake- Josh Lee Kwai, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Waller, Grav Glide, Truck Ty, Jamie Block, Mitch Trafford, and Evan Lindbergh. And of course, do, 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 DJ. DJ. <laughs> thanks, everyone. DJ. I'm DJ. You can see more of me on the Jumbo Commander YouTube channel. Yeah, I love the Jumbo. Actually, you know what I always think about? I always think about the elephant on your playmat because it's such a great piece of art. So if you want more of that elephant, Go to DJ's channel. Uh, and big thanks, as always, Jeffrey Palmer. He does the living card animations that start our show, which is, by the way, a soul ring, just so everyone knows. But we didn't talk about them. Yeah, that, that one drop sucks, though. We all agree there. You can find Jeffrey on Twitter at livingcardsmtg. All right. DJ, this was your topic, and it was a really great one to discuss. I especially like that conversation at the end, which is, would you rather have Swan Song and an offer you can't refuse know, in right? your hand yeah, yeah, yeah. over just Counterspell? Yeah. And I'm, I'm with you. I want those two instead. Very good stuff, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>